Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Perceive 2021. Please give a warm welcome to our distinguished guest, Brett Haskins, who is the CEO at Jute. Brett will be speaking about how Jute is gathering social media intelligence using AI. Brett, welcome to our stage. Hey, thanks, Jeff. Appreciate it. Uh, first off, I just want to uh, thank Clarify for this event and acknowledge all of the uh, speakers and, and the great job that they're doing, uh, thought leaders in the space, and it's just a privilege to be among them. Uh, my presentation today really is a product first approach. Um, Jute is a SaaS application and we over the last several months have been developing this, this this SaaS app that really is meant to be consumed by a really large number of people. And in doing so, it has to be self-served. So as a product, it needs to be something that's easily consumed uh, without a lot of service, without a lot of help and setup. And so from an AI perspective, that's very different than the common, um, the common, uh, uh, you know, type of AI deployment. And so I re really look forward to sharing with you guys kind of our journey and what we've been through. Let me just jump in. So a lot of you probably haven't heard of Jude and don't really know what we do. Um, Jude is a visual AI software company and SaaS application. Uh, really what we do is we take images from Instagram along with all of the metadata for those images. And we apply several layers of computer vision and machine learning to that data to produce some very specific features that help uh, e-commerce vendors, advertisers, social media managers, brand managers, influencers, and the like to do their job better. And so the leading features of our product would include things like uh, predicting image performance for ads and landing pages and social media posts. Uh, we also display performance-based engagement concepts. These are concepts that really teach the creator what they should be creating, high-performing, low-performing, what they should use, what they should avoid, uh, really helps them understand uh, what they should be creating. Um, and then we provide social insights as well. Uh, those are things like social media uh, metrics. We look at uh, not just images, but we also look at things like um, word counts and emojis and some hashtag information. Uh, we use some other uh, AI and products in, in that regard. And so really our product is something that uh, a number of different users use to achieve better performance at their job. So we'll just jump in and this will become even more apparent as we continue. I'll show you some examples and that will set the stage for really what I wanna share with you today about our, our journey and what we've learned and experienced. Okay, so, um, the space that we're in um, really deals with the creator or the social media manager or the advertiser or someone who's trying to make a decision that impacts revenue, right? So a lot of times there's this problem about what image they should display. Should they, uh, what image they should use for the paid ad or what image they should post to organic social media, what images on a landing page are going to persist engagement through the funnel and get them to buy or purchase something, right? So there's this fundamental problem, you know, what image converts? So what Jute does is Jute understands what's going to convert because Jute has studied the data. We've looked at the images. We've used computer vision in many ways to be able to predict what is going to be the most successful. So as someone's trying to decide what to display and, and where and, and, and how, um, 
we can provide them an interface that tells them exactly what they should do based on a ranking and a score. And so here on this screen, you see we have a, a green is the number one. Um, green represents kind of your top 20% of performance. Yellow is uh, kind of average to good. And then red would be your average to below average. And so what this does for a creator uh, or an advertiser or a social media manager is it really creates, uh, puts them in the ballpark of what they should be doing. Uh, Jute also, if we move forward, we provide these, these concepts. So in addition to not just telling them what they should do and what they should use, we give them dozens and dozens of concepts of really great high performing content for them to replicate and create. In this example, obviously use the, we're using women's shoes, but you can see that there's concepts. If they replicate these concepts, they can expect similar high-performing engagement. We also provide uh, imagery of low-performing so they know what to avoid. And that can be just as important is knowing what to avoid so that you're not using low engaging or low quality content, especially in ads uh, where, where the cost of those ads are gonna skyrocket if the ads simply aren't engaging. And a lot of times because of opinion and bias, we don't know. And so we A-B test with subpar content thinking, oh, well, one of these two's gotta work, right? Um, you know, that's what we're trying to help people avoid and achieve higher ROAS in the process. Okay, these are the social insights we've talked about. This is another screen from the product. Um, we look at engagement metrics. Uh, we display the top 10 images. This is a really great way for people to understand what an audience is engaging with at a, at a snapshot view. Um, we also provide the media types, what percentage of media is being used for each account. And you can see in any given market, um, this varies. In some markets, a lot more video is used. In some markets, a lot more carousels are used. Um, if you're a, let's say you're an agency and you have a client that, that is competing in this shoe space, well, just at a quick glance, you can see that the the dominant form of media is single image Instagram posts, right? So you're gonna look at this and understand, oh, this is what competition is doing and this is what's working. Um, you know, upon further analysis, you obviously would try to understand what the engagement is per media type, but this is a great starting point for them to see a market, understand competitors and start to understand the imagery that's succeeding. Okay, so let me get started with the message today. And this is really, um, this is really going to be a story about how we got to this place where now we're selling and we have agencies using this for, you know, uh, dozens of clients and um, they're getting tremendous success. And uh, really the AI is showing it can be incredibly useful and provide a, a, a significantly high return. But getting there isn't easy. And that's kind of the journey I wanna take you on today. Uh, when we were getting started, I wish we would have asked three questions to ourselves um, before we went down the development path. Uh, the first question is, um, is the problem we're trying to solve quantifiable? Um, we knew that the AI that we were using and the way that we were going to use it would produce results, but we could have done more to understand the exact impact of those results. And uh, I, I think that anybody getting started really needs to understand the specific impact uh, and result that they're expecting their client to get and be able to communicate that and develop to that end. Uh, number two, can the AI meet the UI or UX requirements? 
this might be a new concept uh, and something that we found was probably the most significant part of the development and costs the most money ultimately um, because you have almost competing factions. You have your AI team and people that um, are producing the AI and then you have the UX team that is trying to capture uh, what a user really wants to do with this and, and what they have to do and be able to do in an easy way to get their results. So what we learned in this process is that it's really the UX that solves the problem. Um, and so the AI has to meet the UX requirement. You know, and in a SaaS, in the case of SaaS, the user experience will trump the AI. I know that that sounds funny, but it's true. Um, the product has to be usable. It has to be something that a user feels like they can be successful with, regardless of how powerful the AI is or isn't. Um, the AI we found in some cases might need bumper rails to get the strike. Uh, and what I mean by that is AI sometimes needs interpretation layers, or it needs some innovation, or it needs some, some additional middleware added in order to get it to comply with the UX requirements. And we'll talk about that. And third, um, are you really building a product or a set of features? And this is something that came up late in the game with us as we were speaking with a venture capitalist uh, after we had given them a demo and we talked about the target market and we talked about our sales model and, you know, and, and they were saying, wow, this is really cool and I can see how it's helpful and useful. And he brought up this concept of platforms um, and products. And he kind of gave us this uh, insight into something that we wish we would have paid more attention to early on. And that is understanding exactly if we're creating a, a product and our product is meant to be more of a platform, or if we're really creating a set of features that might belong better in a platform ecosystem. And so that's something that we wish we would have considered earlier on. So let's just uh, continue down this process. And um, okay, number one, uh, the quantifiable, are we solving a quantifiable uh, problem? And we made some assumptions early on about this. We knew that we could help people be more successful doing their job. We knew we would save them time. We knew we would prevent them from making big mistakes because we have the intelligence to do it. And we knew we could help them get higher conversions, but we didn't have detail. We didn't have hard factual evidence and numbers to support these assumptions. And a lot of that comes with the development of the product, but at the same time, we, we, we could only estimate and guess and use kind of empirical evidence about some of the, the things that we were doing. So we made these assumptions. The reality of the situation is that customers require specifics. And so they want to see the use cases, they want to see the results, and they want to see the stories that demonstrate exactly what type of experience they can expect to have. So one thing that we needed to do earlier was really look at, hey, if we impact this like this, what is the increase in ROAS and can it be sustained across multiple use cases? What does that look like? What are our averages? So we learned a valuable lesson that SaaS customers, they're not easily impressed with new technology. They're skeptical of AI because everybody is saying they're AI. And they're also looking for these concrete metrics around ROI and a proven path to get there. Uh, the next one. Oh, so here's an example of this. This is a client use case, um, actual client use case. 
uh, one of these images produced 110% more clicks and 1100% more sales. This is a real <laughs> budgeted campaign that one of our uh, agency clients ran, ran for a client and they were shocked that they could choose an image um, that they would use in an ad and that the customer said that they agreed with and then they run the ad and they got a ROAS. They got a like a two or three X ROAS and they thought, hey, this is pretty good. So Jute picks an image that the data suggests more of the audience would engage with. And this was the result. So it was this one here that you see um, you know, on the right of my screen, but uh, that is a Jute selected image that Jute said, hey, Here's an image you should use for this ad. And when they used it, they got this incredible result. So these are the types of things where if you can measure it and quantify it, it becomes a powerful story and a sales tool. And this is something you want to start thinking about really, really early on is what are these specific types of results and experiences and stories that we're gonna be able to go to market with and then start to, um, you know, start to get the, the beta customers, uh, you know, having these experiences in a way that you can start bringing data to the table. Okay, uh, this next one, can the AI meet the UI UX requirements? Um, so we made some assumptions early on uh, about the AI. We were uh, building all these models and putting the information into um, Tableau. And we were looking at images, we were looking at data, we were interpreting the data, we were using it to kind of develop product at the same time the UX is being built. And we're looking at all the data and saying, oh, this data is great. We can do anything with this. We can, we can put a, uh, any sort of UI, UX over the top of this data and it's gonna work awesome. You know, look at all this rich information that we have. Well, the, the reality was that that wasn't the case. In fact, further testing showed us that some of our assumptions were wrong about what we needed for the user to have at their fingertips in order to um, make a decision on something. And, and so this, this, this part of the development where we thought we had enough information in our, in our models and in, our, um, in, in the statistics and the math that we were doing, and we didn't. And, it cost us maybe four months and you know quite a bit of money to develop some IP layering to be able to make the data align with the UX better. And so it was a big lesson learned. And if there's anything I can pass on, it would be to be mindful of the UX requirements and the AI and have the UX and AI people talking regularly, meeting constantly about is there alignment between the two and can the AI support the UX? Here's an example I wanna show you of this. Um, so over here, what's circled in red is a um, three different pictures of a similar concept. So this was one of those cases where we knew we had, in order to solidify a concept, we can't show a single image because a single image, you know, they're, they're, you really can't tell what that concept is. Um, you can just tell what kind of attributes there are in the image. And what it does is it leaves you guessing because we asked people to look at this and tell us the concept. So we found that we needed three similar concepts in order to solidify a single concept, um, a high performing concept or a low performing concept. And so what became um, a, a problem was being able to group 
three images that were almost identical or the same to prove a concept. And this actually took quite a bit of engineering to develop, but the result is super powerful because now when we provide three images of a concept, it is unequivocally clear that what we're looking at is the right thing. And that's what we want the creator to focus on is the right thing so that they can drive the highest performance. Um, this next slide um, shows some of that IP and interpretation layering that is required in addition to the AI um, in order to achieve some of these, these features or to support the UX. Uh, we have invented and developed several different, um, several different uh, uh, features uh, along the computer vision path. We've also uh, invented and developed several different <clears throat> uh, features for machine learning and modeling. Um, and <laughs> some of the names of these things are just, it's kind of fun. Uh, you know, internally, we, we like to have fun with the, the name of some of the the things that we invent, and uh, this is the case here. But this is just to show you um, that AI will rarely work as it, it be, uh, being deployed as a product if it is standalone. Like they're, they're, AI will almost always require some wrappering or some interpretation or some additional IP to make the AI usable in a product environment. And that is especially true for a self-service SaaS app where there's no interference or where there's no explanation or where there's no handholding or services. And so this is just uh, an example of some of the things that we did to uh, enhance AI so that we could um, create our SaaS app. Okay, and number three, uh, is your platform, uh, is your product a platform or an integration, a product or a feature? And this is important to understand and we'll, we'll explain why. Our assumption early on here was that we're developing a SaaS product with a subscription model that agencies and influence and digital mar marketers, creators, they're all just gonna purchase and it's gonna be great, right? It's the, it's the 99 a month and, you know, and it scales, it's product uh, led marketing and, all of this stuff. Um, the, the reality is that SaaS is becoming increasingly dominated by these large platforms and their integration ecosystems. And so products that really only provide some standalone features um, without platform integrations, I, I think they're gonna struggle because the platforms are what own all the user base, right? And people are becoming more and more accustomed to their, their, the platform that they use and the ecosystems in that platform. And so if you're thinking, oh, I'm gonna create this product and this, it's just the standalone product out in the universe, right? Um, it's really not much more than a couple features. So what you're doing is trying to sell people some features. And so this is something that we wish we would have understood a lot earlier in the process because we could have built in a framework earlier that would have allowed us to have a much easier integration path with the major platforms. And when you look at what we're doing, uh, oh, here, this next slide. Um, when you look at what we're doing, you know, there are, you know, dozens of platforms that could use this type of intelligent application. So we started out thinking, okay, here, we're a product, we're going to sell directly to these users. But then what we realized was that a lot of what we were calling product would really be a really, really cool feature if it was integrated into a platform ecosystem for social media, for content creation, for 
uh, your major media libraries and, and photography uh, databases and things like that. And if you think about it, the people that you're trying to target are probably already using and consuming um, a lot of different other sub products and features within their platform usage. So one thing that uh, recently I was looking at, cause I, I like Canva, I use Canva a lot. Um, you know, they've got a great little ecosystem built into the product, right? I can, I can just, you know, fire up Pexels or Pixabay, um, uh, you know, a lot of different things are there right at your fingertips to use. And, you know, that made me think about the effectiveness of, of having an integration strategy earlier on um, and building it into a product so that, you know, once you're going to market, you kind of have this dual approach. If someone sees us in an ad, but they also see us integrated into another platform, you know, the likelihood that your product succeeds, I think goes up by quite a factor. So um, that's kind of the third, uh, the third, third area that we wish we would have uh, addressed. Um, I want to jump forward now as we're coming up uh, on time to talk about some feedback loops. We found this to be extremely beneficial and I just wanna to touch on it here for a minute. And that is what to get feedback on, who to get feedback from and the frequency of that feedback, um, which we call looping. Uh, what to get feedback on. I think when you're setting out to build a product, it's really important that you do get a lot of feedback because um, everyone has opinion and bias and you wanna to try to mitigate that by getting perspective, different perspectives. And so um, we would recommend that you get a lot of feedback at the product concept phase, um, which helps you figure out more of like what it is that you're really trying to build and some of the messaging around it. Um, the product monetization, you definitely want to get feedback on that. Um, you have some ideas about how this is going to be sold, um, who's going to buy it, how much they're going to pay for it. But the sooner you start talking to the actual people who have the budgets to spend the money um, or that are your uh, target um, <clears throat> customer, the, the better you're going to be able to develop a product that actually sells. Uh, same with like product UX. Um, you may have preferences about what you like, how you like to con use software, uh, but it doesn't mean that it's it's the best, and it doesn't mean that a lot of people agree with you. Um, it's always a good idea to get feedback um, on that UX UI process, and then finally, sales and marketing. Uh, and this is easy feedback to get. You can talk to a lot of um, you know, great SaaS salespeople who will shoot holes in your assumptions right away and tell you no one's going to buy that or you need to do this in order for them to buy it. Uh, you should be thinking about this price point. And I mean, you take some of these things with a grain of salt, but other times you actually say, no, you're right. I agree with that. And you make modifications. Uh, who to get feedback from. Um, don't get feedback from just anyone you know, your valuable feedback is going to be from the exact tar target buyer that you have identified, your target persona, you, you know, that, that person who is going to pay the bill. Um, we did this. And what happened was the person said, hey, I don't really care so much about these things that you do, but man, that thing was really powerful. And I could see us using that all the time. That feedback alone helped us just, you know, kind of dial in some things that we needed to be able to sell it more effectively. And if he wouldn't have told us that, we would have continued to, to make assumptions and develop down a path that might not have been effective. Uh, I always like to talk to uh, investors. Um, their job is to be a little bit skeptical, a little bit um, guarded and to poke holes in your assumptions and your business model. These are great, great people to get feedback from. 
and don't be afraid. Um, it will help you better than you know to get feedback from investors early on. Uh, experienced SaaS uh, CEOs, CMOs, sales leaders, um, we have a, a very experienced and uh, wonderful um, investor in uh, Jute who owns a uh, SaaS business. And he has been probably one of the most useful mentors and um, providers of feedback that we've had. And he has changed the course in several instances of how and what we were developing to help us achieve better monetization. And I would recommend uh, you know, involving those people earlier and involving them more often. And, and that leads me to the frequency of feedback and looping. Um, you know, a lot of times you get down a path and weeks go by and you, you know, you, you achieve a milestone and um, you just keep going, but take the opportunity to really check in with people more often. And uh, when I say that, I'm talking about like you know, that exact target buyer or persona that I told you about. Um, I, I would talk to them almost every month or every other month and, and just get their perspective. They may have an experience because once you get in their mind, once you get in their thought process, they're going to come up with a lot of different ways to use your product. They're also going to have experiences in the day-to-day -day where they can say, you know, I didn't even realize this, but I have this problem. I think you could solve it with this. So keep that person close and keep that feedback loop tight every month, every other month. I mean, sit down and go over your product with them. Listen a lot and hear what they have to say. Uh, institutional investors, fantastic. Get with them early and then get with them at alpha and, and beta and they will guide you. And also, I think they'll be impressed with, you know, the process. They, they like to see that. Um, and then with the experienced SaaS CEOs and CMOs, um, I, once again, early, and then also kind of at your alpha and beta. Um, I think those are, those are good guidelines for how frequently you want to, you want to get with these people. You don't want to bother them too much, but you want them to be a part of your journey. And so, <clears throat> So in just, uh, just wrapping up here in summary, um, three things, just real quick. Uh, the first one, key to a successful AI product uh, deployment is the IP that you add to the project. Um, I showed you the screen of all of that IP we had to add to get where we, um, to get the product that we needed. And I don't think that it's, it's really possible to use a lot of out-of-the-box AI and come up with this, this incredible and fantastic product that's new and, and highly capable. I, I think you need innovation. You need uh, AI interpretation. You need to, to, to expand on what's possible and, and have that be a part of your product and product planning. Uh, number two, be sales-minded from the beginning. The main reason why businesses fail and, and, and why so many AI businesses especially fail is because they're not thinking about sales before they get started. I think they've got a notion that, or they believe that something will sell, but that's not the way you go about it. Um, quantifiable results, very specific results. Uh, are what you're looking for and what you're anticipating and what you're modeling around. And um, start early with that and, and get feedback early because a lot of times if you talk to the right people, they're gonna shoot holes in your assumptions and help you either get on the right path or get off the path and stop wasting money. Um, number three, uh, finally, AI must meet the UX requirements for SaaS. SaaS is all about UX. It's all about the user experience. And so um, don't skimp on UX and don't have your, your AI team dictate UX. In fact, that's exact opposite. Your UX, if this is a SaaS app, and I can only speak to, to SaaS here, but have, you know, for, for, for SaaS, the UX needs to be 
the primary consideration and the UX needs to fit into that. And the, the AI, I mean, needs to fit into that UX in a way that fulfills the application. And I think as you go that route, you'll find that you create the very, very best product. So, um, so that's my summary and some of the things that we learned. Um, I would love to answer any uh, questions. Please send me an email, reach out to me. I'm happy to share our story, things that we've learned, happy to answer questions. And once again, I just wanna say thanks to Clarify for putting this event on and allowing us to get together and, and uh, talk about AI and the, the successes and the challenges. It's an exciting time and I'm, I'm so happy that uh, I'm able to be a part of it. Uh, good luck everyone and, uh, and we'll see ya. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Brett. Uh, it was a pleasure to learn uh, some some of the you know practical lessons you've learned from uh, implementing this kind of technology in the real world, and a big round of applause from a virtual audience. And we will see you all at our next session.